wonderful day and for this wonderful opportunity, this privilege to come together and think together and pray together and look for visions and uh, dreams to come true. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Tomorrow night, uh, Mary Light will uh, occupy this pulpit. For those who come from out of town or come only in the evenings, be an opportunity to hear Mary Light. Uh, I'll speak tomorrow morning. Uh, we will have a speaker at 4 o'clock tomorrow. We have some wonderful uh, folks. We had a wonderful address by Zeta Sherry this afternoon. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful uh, week. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that tonight I'd like to talk about the first camp farthest out. It was held 4,000 years ago, and uh, 2,000 years before the coming of Jesus. Uh, the experience then was so similar to what our, well, our camps has been. For instance, uh, we had a camp in, uh, uh, in California at uh, Glendora. But after two years, uh, they said, the place is too small for us. We've got to find a bigger place. So we went to Whittier College for two years, and then they said, this place is too small for us, and we went to Pomona College. After two years, they said, this place is too small for us, and ever since then, we've gone to Redlands University. We had a camp in um, Ohio at uh, Denison, and after a number of years, we decided we should have a bigger place, and they went to Ohio Wesleyan for this year. 540 people have uh, signed up and they're turning down all, uh, closing all registrations. Biggest camp we ever had. Well, that's the experience of this uh, first camp farthest out. A young man said to the, uh, to the director of the camp, this place is too small for us. Let us go down to the Jordan and each one of us will cut down a tree and we'll, by working together in a cooperative effort, we'll build a larger place. And uh, uh, the director said, uh, all right, you go. And then the young man said, won't you go too? And he said, I will go. And he went. The reason I call this the first camp, camp farthest out is because it was not a school for the priests. It was a school for the prophets. The Levites were the priests. But this was one open to the prophets. A theological seminary trains one in church history and church dogma and, and uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful, does wonderful work in the study of the Bible and teaches them how to give sermons and how to conduct their member canvas and a lot of organizational things. They don't have time to teach prayer or are practicing the presence of God. All the theological professors I've talked with say that's our one lack. Uh, they know less about prayer when they graduate usually than when they come in. It's a thing we didn't think we could uh, teach them. Now the Camp Fathers Out doesn't teach you how to, doesn't give you church history or the, uh, the rituals or the dogmas of the church. It doesn't take time to teach you how to give sermons or raise the ever memory canvas. The only thing we teach here is how to pray and how to practice the presence of God and how to let God work through you in your creative writing or painting and everything else. It exposes you to be a channel as of what they call the prophets in those days. So this was a school for the prophets. Uh, the first, the founder of it was very much like the founder of the camp's farthest out. He was a little bit overweight. He uh, cared, uh, he uh, never did anything that anyone else could do for him. And he was constitutionally lazy. When you'd ask him to think a thing through, he'd say, that's too hard, let us pray. Uh, <laughs> well, <clears throat> and so, uh, when uh, Naaman came down, famous as a Macar General MacArthur of his day, he had a whole uh, cavalcade of cavalry with him. When the news was brought in to uh, Elisha that uh, Naaman was there, he just remained in his uh, 
in his study, uh, reading the Reader's Digest, and he said, you tell General Naaman to go and jump in the lake. Well, that insulted Naaman. He said at least he should have come out and bowed and uh, been polite. Uh, and uh, aren't the rivers of Babylon just as important as this river Jordan he told me to jump into seven times? And he was disgusted, but they suggested you go and do the thing. He, was, he took the easy way. He asked the Lord for guidance, and the Lord said to tell him to bathe seven times. I have found that if you bathe your soul, and then you bathe your mind, and then you bathe your emotions, and then you bathe your, uh, your uh, go to a spa and drink lots of water and bathe your inner self, and then you bathe your lungs by breathing right, brain, bathe your blood vessels by giving the right kind of vitamins and, and uh, fresh vegetables and so on, and bathe your outer skin. You, by the time you finish giving those seven baths, if you do it right, especially the first one, bathing the soul, that you're pretty likely to get well. And I've written a book, uh, two books on healing, in which both cases I take up the seven baths of Jordan. I still think there's a marvelous significance in that. And uh, the interesting thing is that Elisha had more answers to prayer than anyone in the Old Testament. They were not big answers. He wasn't as big a man. He was just a more efficient technician in prayer. I've done some things in prayer, and I've written 20 books about it. And Elisha did more things than I did. Why didn't he at least write one book? He didn't write a one. But in the first, first seven verses of the sixth chapter uh, of the um, second book of Kings, you will find the whole secret of Elisha's method of prayer, uh, which was the method they used in the first camp farthest out. If we learn how to pray as they learned back in those days and apply it, we'll find it just as effective today. I rather like to get things by hidden codes. I wrote a textbook uh, that, uh, on the short story in which I use all kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, inferences. I, I teach that my student writers to become sort of amateur detectives. I tell them to describe the interior of a room, for instance, to reveal that the, the, uh, the indweller is a millionaire and that it has been occupied by uh, robbers who are scared away suddenly. And they're not to have anybody come in or anything. They've just got to show it by the interior, uh, the whole thing. I received a telephone call one day from um, uh, the, the uh, police uh, reporter of a big newspaper. And he said, uh, you are a psychologist, are you not? And I said, uh, no, I'm not. Well, you've written a book that goes into a lot of uh, uh, hidden uh, inferences, how to, how to unravel secret codes. And I said, yes, a textbook on the short story. Well, uh, we found the coat of a man on the high bridge, and we found in, the, in it a, a note which said, Goodbye, old world. I hope, uh, I hope they will not find my body so it won't cause my wife that extra expense and it's signed by a certain name. Do you think that he committed suicide? The police are getting ready to, uh, to uh, uh, drag the river, and uh, they want to get some experts' opinion. And I said, no, he did not commit suicide. And uh, he said, why? In the first place, he wouldn't take his coat off. The coat would help him to drown a little faster. Then if he wrote that note, he wouldn't put in it, I hope they won't find my body so it won't cause my family that extra expense. That's to remove any uh, criticism uh, of the family if they don't push a lot of uh, uh, dragging of the river. And uh, he said, thank you. That night, the paper came out with a great column all about uh, me and about they expanded that into a whole column. And then the leading headlines a uh, famous uh, psychologist says that uh, Mr. Uh, J.K. Borden did not commit suicide. <laughs> and my wife, when she read that, she was startled and she was scared. She never do a thing like that, Glenn. Why, if he didn't commit suicide, he may come out and commit murder. He may, uh, 
Later on, they discovered that he is heavily in debt and that he had fled to another state and that my inference was correct. Now, I love to trace codes. During the First uh, World War, they discovered that uh, many, many phonograph records were being smuggled through Spain into Germany. They intercepted many, found they're perfectly innocent, thought they'd just dropped the whole thing, but in one of the war offices, one of the French detectives happened to have uh, neglected to wind the phonograph, and suddenly, as it was running down, he heard a mysterious click, clickety-click, click, 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 and he discovered by letting these run very slowly, there was a little secret signals, and then they decoded it, they found that all the information about the movement of the Allied armies and the Allied navies were being smuggled in. All they had to do was to let the machine go slowly enough and they could read the code. I have found that if I sit down before the Bible, almost any passage, uh, Zeta Sherry gave, uh, this afternoon gave a wonderful expression of one who loves the Bible and her passages that just had meanings, they just rolled out. Uh, she would sit down in front of the Bible and just uh, get quiet, and she'd get deep meanings in this passage or that passage. You try it sometime. Open to the 91st Psalm or the 104th Psalm or, or one of the chapters in the Gospel and just sit there for a while and get quiet, and you'll find great hidden secret codes, meanings coming forth. And so let us get quiet before these few verses, and here, the, here it moves on. Uh, he's... The young man was chopping away on, a, on one of the trees, and all of a sudden the axe head flies out into the river. And he cries, alas, it was borrowed. Now the axe handle is what we usually take hold of. Many of us uh, don't go any farther than the axe handle. By the axe handle, I mean if you go to college and want to give messages, you learn all the gestures but you don't get the soul of the thing. I've seen some wonderful orators. Uh, I know I went over to give us, as one of us to be three speakers on prayer uh, 25 years ago in Minneapolis. I had just written a book. And the man that came before me gave a wonderful talk on prayer. A minister gave a marvelous talk on prayer. And then after it was the convention, the meetings were all over, he came to me secretly and he said, those were just words. I've got the handle, but I don't have the fine edge. I haven't had any experience with prayer. Everything I said was just borrowed. I, I mean, it was just, uh, just uh, mechanics, the mechanics of it. Now, I want to say this. That young man cried it was borrowed. If you have any power in your prayer, you'll find it's borrowed. If there's any power in the speakers, Mary Light or myself or any of us that speak here, We'll have to confess, frankly, that we don't, uh, we aren't any great orators at all. We're no great shakes as orators. Uh, if there's any power, it's all from the man upstairs. And if we lose that which is borrowed, we've lost everything. Uh, I sometimes think with our churches, we've just worked with the handles. If we could all get into the prayer, everyone, every Christian in America, believe us thoroughly in prayer, some of you folks believe, as Mary Light believes. Why, what would happen? Why, we could just break, pray this whole world out of its soul, its misery and trouble. Uh, but you can't do it, you can't cut down any evil forces with just the handle. Well, now here comes the secret code. Uh, where did you lose it, said Elisha. Now, that's the first thing you should ask. Even the psychiatrist asked that. Uh, They'll, they'll sit down in front of you, and you'll have them sit there, uh, or other, the, the carters will have you uh, stretch out there on a couch, and he sits behind you, and then he asks you questions. And then he charges you $50 for that half hour, and then you come the next, uh, next week, and he gives you another 50, you give him another $50. Uh, when I, before I started the first camp farthest out, I was speaking in Harry Emerson Fosdick's church, and a woman came to me and she said, I've spent $10,000. I have gone to see a psychiatrist twice a week for two years, and he still can't find the place where this thing began. I said, next summer we're going to have a camp farthest out, the first one we've ever had, 
you come down there and we'll see if we can't find the problem, and we did. And today you go to Gold Farm, a place where the uh, broken down folks go to get healed, you'll find that this woman is the rock of Gibraltar there. She's the one that lifts them all up. And so uh, the psychiatrists say, where did you lose it? And that's what Jesus did, the first psychiatrist that ever lived. When the man came with a boy that was fell into a fit, into an epileptic uh, condition, the uh, first thing that uh, Jesus said was, uh, where did he uh, first lose this power? Where did this thing begin? Of a child, it would throw him into fire sometimes, and sometimes into the water. All right, that tells me where it begins. Now I'm going to tell you where it ends. You take hold where it begins, right at the end. You take a log that's in the house and you toss it out. But I'd like to get hold of where it begins. And then he just healed him like that. Uh, I received a letter from uh, my, sis, my daughter in Dayton, Ohio, and she said, a lovely woman, Mrs. Arnold here, has a daughter, a mar young married daughter in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, who hasn't been able to eat anything for four years, I mean hold anything. Uh, she's only held four meals in the four years. Well, how does she live? She eats ten big square meals a day, and she just holds them for about ten minutes, or about uh, two or three minutes. And that's the way she keeps alive, but she's gradually fading away. She's getting to be skin and bones. The doctors examine her uh, and find nothing the matter with her body nor with her nerves or anything else, and it's all it's a mystery. Uh, Mrs. Arnold wants to know if she'll pay her way clear up to St. Paul. Will you pray for her? Well, now, I don't have any p power in prayer. I mean, uh, I mean, I never have healed anyone. God does the healing. And when I'm a complete a channel enough, and if they have the faith enough, God gets to work. Well, I didn't want anyone to spend the hundreds of dollars to come up there just to have me sit and pray. I said, I'm going down to Atlanta in a month. Uh, to be speaking in the First Methodist Church. She, she could perhaps ride over there, and I could pray with her there. So she came, she and her husband. Uh, I asked her, when did this first begin? Where did you lose it? Where did you lose your power to eat food? She said, when I first married, I thought that if I got too fat, my husband would stop loving me. I said, now your subconscious heard you say that. And the subconscious has a lot more to do with one's condition than any of his conscious mind. We'll call the subconscious a junior. Little junior heard you say that, and junior will do anything for his mistress. He will, uh, when he heard you didn't want to get too fat, he said, all right, I'll see that you don't get too fat. I'll see you don't get any fat. I said, are you afraid you'd, uh, your husband stop loving you now? No, I should say not. He stuck through me through thick and thin, especially thin, and I said, well, uh, little junior, you heard her say that. She wants to get some fat now. I want to thank you, little junior, for being so faithful to see that she didn't get any fat. Uh, you were so obedient, but you misunderstood the situation. Now you heard her say that she wants to get some, and you're hearing me say that, and I'm going to command you to see that she gets plenty of fat now. And I said, you come to breakfast tomorrow at my hotel, you and your husband, and eat a big breakfast. She gained 35 pounds, which brought her up just to the shape of a Venus de Milo. I have to explain that. What women all run from me if they think I'm going to pray for them with that effect. However, uh, if they're too thin, you can pray yourself into better. And uh, if you're too fat, maybe you can pray it down. <laughs> well... Uh, before the year's over, I was in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, speaking in the First Methodist Church. It was so packed, 1,200 people, they had to sit in the aisles and they had to turn away 100, and I said to the minister, do they turn out like this? Oh, no, he said. But for all year long, every time they'd meet Mrs. Carnes out on the, on the street, they'd stop and say, what's happened to you? And she'd say, you come to the Methodist Church and on 14th of March of February, and you'll see what happened to me. She is chairman of the council ring of this uh, North Carolina camp. We have to have two camps every year. She's a, the, one of the leaders in the prayer group work in, in, in Greenville. 
Her mother is so thrilled, uh, not only that her life is saved, but because her soul was so saved. That's the thing that thrills her soul. Where did you lose it? Where did you begin? I could go back and tell a great many experiences there. I could tell how Mary Welch, skin and bones, because she couldn't eat uh, peas and drink milk or, or eat tomatoes. That years will go when she didn't want to live. She'd heard someone say those three things of her life-giving, and after that, if she ate one of them, she got uh, headaches. After the other one, she got uh, stomach ulcers. If she ate the other one, she'd get the rheumatism. And then we found she was happy now, and she wished she had nine lives to live. And so we talked to little Junior, and said, now you see that she can eat those. Now you come, come to dinner table tonight, and you eat tomatoes, eat peas and drink milk. And she gained 35 pounds and she's speaking all over the nation now. Uh, there is a real secret there. The psychiatrists use it. Well, we, we like to find those things. But now here comes the real camp farthest out method. He then took a stick and he tossed it out where the thing had been lost. And then the ax head came swimming up to the surface. Some people think, of course, that must have been a mere uh, superstition that the uh, heavy ox head couldn't swim. But I got on a building that was five times, no, 20 times the length of this building, made of steel and iron, and it folded and it carried me across to Europe. Uh, last year, I got on a, a building as long as this, made of steel and iron, and it floated and it carried me through the air all around the world regular magic carpet. To me, an ax head floating up through the water is nothing to discuss. It, uh, it's how it came, and this is the way it, this is the how. First, he took hold of something that he could grasp with his hand, not a little straw that would flow away nor a great big, uh, a big uh, eucalyptus tree, something that fitted his grasp and tossed it out there, and it came up. That is the method that Jesus used. He, he called them parables. He'd take parallel situations. Here's a woman uh, and, uh, that uh, uh, wanted to put, get love into her family. Uh, and he said, well, put some uh, leaven into three measures of meal, and presently the whole loaf will be leaven. Well, that worked with bread. Well, you know, you take the same faith that you put in that pinch of leaven, and you put the same quality of faith that you can take hold of in love, and put love into those three measures of men in your home, those sons and that husband, and just see the whole home get leaven. Uh, Roland Brown had, uh, in his church at Parkside, Chicago, had a troublemaker. His wife said, supposing you love her, an old cranky woman, and he began to just shoot love at her, and presently she was all changed. A grouchy uh, deacon that just was a, a thorn in his flesh. Uh, he, uh, his wife said, why don't you send love to him? Send love to him, huh? Love to him, huh? He didn't see how he could do that. And she said, well, it worked with that old lady. You try it. So he did. And then there's a third one. He put love into three measures of people, and that whole church was leavened. They asked him to come to Benton Harbor, and he found a, a captain of the police, and he found a leading det a politician that just hated each other. And they wanted to start living this life, and he said, oh, well, there's anyone you hate. Each one had been called separately, and they mentioned the other person. Well, I believe that'd be a good place to begin. What do you think you ought to do? Well, I suppose I ought to pray for him and love him, and I don't know how. You'll have to show me. Well, he got those two men together, and they knelt down there. It was after midnight, and they prayed by respect most of all night, and they got to love each other. Uh, the Benton Harbor, the crime rate there, I think, was about as high as any city in America. And now that uh, leading politician is the mayor of uh, Benton Harbor and that police captain is the chief of police and they, the crime rate is the lowest, one of the lowest in all America. He just put that love into there and he changed the city. He, uh, you can make this, uh, you see the miracle of taking hold of a thing with faith, as Jesus put it? There's a woman who um, uh, had a hemorrhage and John Hopkins couldn't help her, and uh, Mayo Hospital couldn't. Uh, why, why couldn't they? Well, because uh, she couldn't get to them. Was that too bad? Couldn't we lend her some money so she could buy the railroad ticket? 
Well, she was too far away, not in space, but in time. She lived 2,000 years before Mayo Hospital had been uh, built. Well, what could she do? She said, I make the clothes for my family, and I put love into those clothes, and I hem them up very carefully, and there's no frays and no uh, uh, tears in them. Now, God made my body, and the man of Galilee said on the mountain that if a father, if you were... Uh, if his son asked for bread, he wouldn't give him a stone. And if, uh, if I love a garment that I make so carefully that I can hem it up, why can't God, who made my body, love it enough to hem me up? And then she said, the most marvelous uh, garment I've seen has been is that garment, all of one piece and woven from above, worn by that man of Galilee. Uh, I know this, that if I could take hold of that hem of that garment... It would give me just the faith all up through my, I could just feel it vibrating through my whole being. I could just feel that God could take hold of my body and he could hem it up. Whatever woman made that garment must have put love into it, but I, she couldn't hold a candle to the love that a God of love had put into the making of my body. But how can I do it, she said, if, as she told her neighbor. And the neighbor said, wife, anyone saw you grab a, a, a man of God by the hem of his garment? They would say, there's a woman of the street, and they would just be only too glad to take you out of the side of the city walls and stone you to death. And so that chance of healing was lost. But as the crowd was gathering, and she uh, noticed women packed together there, and he's going down through that crowd, a daring uh, scheme came to her mind. If I got behind the group of women, and when he came by, if I knelt down and reached under their garments and touched, just touched the hem of his, no one would know it. I could do it. And she did it, and no one knew it. And to this day, her, na her name and fame, the episode had never have gotten into that great, uh, divine classic of the New Testament. But the man of Galilee always knew when someone touched him with faith, and so he said, somebody touched me. Why, of course, the disciples said. Why, they thronged you. Everybody touched you. You bumped against a hundred people. Why are you... Why are you going to bother to go back? No, he said, I'm not talking about the external touch. Somebody touched me with that living faith, and something has happened to them. I'm going back, and he went back. And that woman has gone down in history. They're even singing songs about her. Why, well, there's no one that's more dramatic in all that happened because Jesus came back, and he saw her flashing face, radiant now, and he said, thy faith has made thee whole. Now there's this one, uh, one school of uh, modern religion that say that when the Bible closed, uh, that the curtain went down on every miracle. You can't expect answered prayers. Healing should not be brought into the churches. That ended with Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth who said, greater works than I have done ye shall do. Because I go unto the Father, and my wishes multiplied in power by infinity will come down the form of the Holy Spirit and will just release new power. A woman came to me in a Texas camp, and she said, I have a flow of blood. I have an inner hemorrhage, and I wish you'd pray for me. And I took her into the prayer room with Roberta Fletcher, who is the prayer hostess, and I said, kneel down in front of this great picture of Psalms, the, the, the presence. I have seen him paint. He's a spiritual, a Christ-like man himself. He put a lot of love into that picture. And he noticed how beautifully hemmed up that garment is. And I told her about the woman of 2,000 years away. And I said, now you touch the hem of the garment in that picture. And know this, that Mr. Salmon didn't love that picture as much as God loved you and your body when he made you. And if he could hem that up with his paintbrush, God can paint hem you up with his infinite divine love. She touched, uh, knelt and touched the hem, and uh, Roberta and I prayed, and she was healed instantly, and it has never come back. <clears throat> Two months later, <coughs> with Coronas, a woman came to me and said, I've got to leave. Just one day I've been here, and I'm just so thrilled. I just, oh, I just was terribly disappointed to get this letter from my daughter. Ever since uh, her second child came, she's had an inward... Uh, uh, flow of blood. 
And here comes this letter. The doctor told me today that my blood count is getting so low, low that it won't be safe to wait. He's going to operate on me next week. And so she said, I'm going to phone in for a, a, a plane ticket and leave tomorrow. And I said, just wait a minute. Let us come in to the chapel. There's a picture of Solomon's Jesus, but there are the sheep are all around the hem of the garment, and we had to have her step on her tiptoes and touch the folds of the garment. And I told her the woman 2,000 years away in Galilee and the woman 2,000 miles away in Texas, and I said, now you touch this, and I'm going to pray for the healing uh, and the hemming up of your, your daughter's trouble. And when I finished praying, I think uh, I felt a lot of faith here. I just felt it tremendously. I have a feeling that your daughter is, is healed. I'm going to suggest you write a letter and send it by air mail. Ask her to reply by return mail. It'll take two days to get out there, two days to get back, and so you'll still have two days or three days to get there before the week is up. Ask your daughter just how she feels, when the operation's to be, and when she wants you to come. She wrote the letter. Four days later, she came with a reply. She said, I just came from the doctor. He said, all my organs are now perfectly sound. The healing must have come two days ago, he said, as exactly the day we were praying. And I won't need an operation. I was telling this last year to the, out at the Portland camp farthest out. A woman was sitting in the back seat. A white-haired lady rose, and she said, I am that mother that prayed with you at Cronus. Uh, that uh, trouble, uh, she was instantly healed, and, and it never came back. I've just received a letter today, it just came here, and I have it in my hand, that her third child has come, and it just came uh, this, this week, and it's a perfectly normal birth, and everything is sound and well. I've had two other experiences of this, but I'm not going any farther or you'll say we should stick out a sign, become a specialist on that one thing. Folks, if you can get the right leverage and the right atmosphere, the right attitude, I'm not going to gamble and uh, do any daring things on this or uh, stick out my neck out as a, in an external way. These people came to a camp farthest out. They were trusting in prayer. They had faith in my prayer. They had faith in this parable. There's something in them happened that I'm not sure it could always happen. But I want to say that because this has happened so often, I have found that you could go home now and if you had a situation like that, you can find uh, trusting that and using that leverage of Jesus of Nazareth. That's the hem of something that was, that was sewed up with, with love, with, just with love and marvelous things can come. Why, uh, because I always wear uh, just the, I have one gar suit of clothes, uh, buy one suit of clothes about every third year and wear it winter and summer, and I have the old one of the three years before for other things. Uh, down south, they felt sorry for me, going around in a winter suit, and they took my, a suit of mine in to be pressed, and they got the measurement, and they sent a blue third suit, summer suit here. It can't reach me here. It didn't quite fit, so I, Bernie uh, Warfield took me down to a tailor, and we had it put in shape. And, uh, and I've been wearing that until the finally it's, it's, uh, three years ago, and I'm just getting ready to give it the goodwill. And I, uh, the, uh, I wore it all through the uh, heat of the South in India and uh, all that, but actually happened right here. And this is what happened. When I left this, I went to Indianapolis, and a businessman took me out to the hospital because his wife was having a hemorrhage of the stomach, and they was of an operation, and she, they couldn't stop it. And I said, we don't have any picture of Jesus here, but here's a garment given to me in love. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to touch the hem of this garment, and we'll pray. And when I reached Cleveland, uh, they came down to the, uh, so my meeting, the son of that family, and said, I just got a telephone that my, the day after, my mother was taken home all healed, that that touch of the garment did it. I, I could go on and tell you these things, but the reason why I brought that in is because it happened right here. That garment was all put in shape here with the love of, uh, of uh, Bernie. I don't think he ever has his suits made by a tailor. I think that he gets 
cheaper ones. That's what I used to do. But at any rate, he could hit me down and uh, just was put it around with the love. I don't know if they charged me anything. Well, here it is. They put that aside. Get hold of a leverage. And then you say, now, Glenn Clark must be rolling in money. All he has to do is to use the lever and pull in the money, you know. I want to tell you this. When I was uh, 40 years old, I didn't own a car. If you give your life to the Lord you, and, you, and really want to tithe your income and have three children and uh, live on a college professor's salary and, uh, and uh, pay, make payments on a house, you can't afford a car. And so uh, we'd go out Sunday afternoon. My wife would push the baby carriage, the little two months old. I'd pull a little wagon with a little two-year-old. And our little four-year-old in a white dress would trot along and inspect all the gutters and the alleys. And after about eight blocks, we'd return to our porch, all exhausted, and uh, watch the neighbors go out in their Cadillacs and their Fords to pick the flowers in beautiful southern Minnesota. And one day I said to my wife, and the children are little, we ought to have a cheap touring car, just the cheapest Ford car you can find. And she looked it up, and she told me the next day, we could, if you had $100 more, we could safely make the payments. Otherwise, we'll be in debt for life. I said, in that case, in that case, we better push the baby carriage. Well, I said last summer, though, I, I get something here. I get one of these levers I can take hold of. Our little four-year-old dug a well in the seashore sand, and she waited patiently till the tides came in and filled it. She had to wait quite a while, but she knew they would come. Let us think of the need for $100 as a little well, and just leave it to the Lord. And if he wants us to have the car, he can send in the tides. With all the seven oceans, he ought to have a plenty to fill a little well, if he really wants us to have it. But if it's a mere shadow of a well, a mere wishful thinking, uh, he won't need to fill it. We'll leave it to him. Uh, ten days later, a young man rang our bell one night, and he said, I represent a Ford agency, and I understand you're planning to buy a Ford touring car. We had, that was exactly what we were thinking about, but we hadn't told anyone but the Lord. That was the first time I discovered that, he that Henry Ford must have some private uh, pipeline for the Lord. <laughs> We told him the situation. He said, well, you'll have to decide by a week from Monday or I can't guarantee a car of that make this year. I, when he left, I said, well, Lord, there's a little well, and if you want to fill it, it's up to you, and we'll abide by your wish. A week from Monday, a letter came. I opened it out, and I'll fill a check for $108. The letter told how I'd been a teacher at another college for 12, uh, 12 years before, and as I tithed, I'd given $100 to the endowment fund, and now it is becoming a junior college and is returning the last 100000 to the uh, donors. I've been connected with the colleges all my professional life, and the biggest miracle ever happened to me was a college giving back some of its endowment fund. <laughs> my wife was embarrassed. She's a good Presbyterian, and to have a prayer answered like that, she said, now they'll call us New Thought or Christian Scientists or some some cult or other, and there are all the members of the board, all the board of trustees of McAllister College are either Presbyterian elders or Presbyterian ministers. And I belong, brought up in the Presbyterian church, and I know they wouldn't like this. My father was brought up a uh, Methodist, my mother a Presbyterian, and when they married, they compromised and became Congregationalists. I was brought up a Congregationalist, my wife was brought up a Presbyterian, and when we mar married, we compromised and became Presbyterians. <laughs> now, I always thought Presbyterians uh, were more pious than the Congregationalists, so I thought they would welcome this, but she said no. But I went to see an old lady, oh yes, I said, uh, I'm going to uh, use this power now. I, I promised my wife that we wouldn't use it for our family anymore. Didn't have to after that money came in as we needed it. So I said, what we need is a gymnasium. All the other colleges have fine gymnasiums, and I have to take my boys out and have them wait in the snow, the track boys, to get in shape for the spring training. I'm going to doubt the trustees and tell them about my answered prayers and ask them if they won't let me pray with them for a gymnasium. And then my wife said, no. So I went to see a dear old lady and asked her what she thought about it. She said, you and your wife have been praying for that gymnasium? And I said, yes. Well, you won't need to see the trustees. 
As you were talking, I could see that gymnasium coming. It's going to come before anyone expects. It's going to come this year. It's going to come from a student in your writing class. Well, she's getting too specific, so I left before she told me whether it'd be a blonde or a brunette. <laughs> and I went home and told my wife I decided to take her advice and not see the trustees. And then I told her about this strange prophecy, and we laughed at the side. But in the middle of the winter, a little sophomore girl, working away entirely through college, didn't have a cent of her own to her name, came up and said, can I see you, Prop? I said, I have some important people to see, to, uh, to promise to see. And I'll see you some other time. And I turned my back and left a gymnasium standing in the center of that room. To this day, I can't remember who those important people were. But two days later, when that class convened again, here's that little sophomore girl. She said, you know, Prof, we honor the football boys. We give them a banquet at the end of the season. We give them letters and sweaters and honor them. We cheer them when they play. But we have 20 trustees, and six of them have worked for the college for 20 years, and we've never done anything to honor them. It occurred to me it'd be a nice thing if the students, not the faculty, but just the students, would give a party to the trustees. Well, my knees got weak because I could see a gymnasium floating right in. <laughs> I have asked many places all over the world if they've ever known of a case where the students, not the faculty, but the students ever gave a party to the trustees, and I've never, they've never heard of such a thing anywhere. Well, I suggested we appoint five students, or representative folks, that would represent this at the next convocation of the student body and see what they voted. They voted to do the thing. All the trustees came. The next week, the trustees sat around a table, and they said, those are wonderful boys and girls of ours. First time I ever realized what a marvelous privilege it is to be a trustee. They're just like a family of sons and daughters. Well, we ought to do something for them. Well, what do they need? Well, they need a gymnasium. Well, uh, depression or no depression, let's give them a gymnasium. And they pulled out $200,000 and laid on the table. And the finest gymnasium of any college in the Middle West went up, and we had an open winter, the first thing I'd ever, I'm, I'd ever heard of a thing like that. You could put a spade in the ground in February, and that gymnasium went up. And Jimmy Dixon, my long-distance runner, running around that indoor track, fell in love with that little Lillian. And when they graduated, he became, they married and went to Formosa. And folks, when we came to Formosa, we found Lillian. She'd been on a... She had been, uh, and uh, James Dixon, they were on a, a furlough, and we were afraid they wouldn't be there, but she was called back for some occasion a week before we arrived, and she just arranged everything she asked for it happened. Why, uh, she even came out and met us at the, out right at the plane. They could let her walk right through the, uh, the gates to receive people. We found she took us out and had us address the lepers, thousands of lepers, and she has just been saving them and they're stopping their committing suicide by making things happy and creative. And I talked to them on the fanner bees. And she rose when I finished my talk. And she said, we're, I'm going to promise you, Glenn Clark, that we're going to have 25 uh, prayer groups here. And I got a letter just a little while ago that they were starting those prayer groups. And she's gotten a gift of a, of a new house or two, building or two. And they're finding ways of curing these lepers. Out in front of me uh, was a vested choir, all men, Chinese men, members of the army of Chiang Kai-shek that come down to leprosy. They rose and they sang a solo. Over here was a mixed choir, beautiful girls, and these handsome young men, doomed for life. She is just the angel that just holds them up. And then they took us up into the mountains, where the headhunters are. The headhunters, you couldn't, uh, they, they weren't to, uh, couldn't be accepted in polite society until they could bring home a head. Now what's happened? These uh, Dixons, he's president, uh, the way, of this, uh, the Presbyterian Theological Seminary where we spoke. They s send their, stu their students up there, converting them, and th th those headhunters have built 160 churches in the last uh, five years, built them with their own hands without a cent of help from American churches. They're being manned by the Dixons and these students. 
We went up there and we found, as we traveled along through the mountains, uh, everyone who had a shining, radiant face, he's a Christian. The Christians don't drink nor smoke. And they're not permitted to join the church until they've brought a soul in. Instead of bringing a head in, they bring in souls now. It's the fastest moving, the most outstanding movement in all the history of modern missions. The thing that is moving all through those mountains. Those head hunters are becoming the most marvelous soul hunters in, uh, of all Asia. I was before, during the Second World War when the Dixons had been driven out. I was driving her across the Minneapolis to St. Paul to an address of church and she said, Prof, do you remember the first spadeful of dirt dug up for that gymnasium? You put some of it in a little glass bottle and you gave to me? I'd forgotten that, I said. Well, she said, that bottle's been with me from Mosa and Japan and wherever I go. I said, well, you hold fast to that. That is when you just erase yourself, just like the clay of the, the Christ come walking in. Yes, if it, you, when I was uh, uh, in India, it, uh, Stanley Jones came and gave an address in our camp farther south, and he said, if you're going to Formosa, there's a missionary that you must meet, the most wonderful missionary. Her first name is Lillian. I've forgotten her last name. I said her last name is Dixon. <laughs> Roland Brown said, why, she was a student. She's the disciple of Glenn Park. Oh, he said. And when we had the, uh, the, that time, that, uh, that week down of Topeka in 1950, and uh, when, uh, when my book came out, uh, What Would Jesus Do? A sequel to In His Steps. Uh, down there, they, the, all the ministers and the mayor and all the city turned over the municipal stadium, I mean, the auditorium for us. We held meetings all week, and I had great speakers. One of them was, was uh, Daniel Poling, and he flew all the way from Formosa to get there in time. And he's, I mean, reading supper, he just, all the time, he said, I want you to, there's one, I had the most wonderful meeting out there. There's a one, the most wonderful mission I ever met. Her name is Lillian. Dixon. Her husband is president of the theological seminary, and she, I just let him talk and talk and talk. And when he finished, I said, now I'm going to tell you something that happened at McAllister. I told him where the gymnasium came, and when he got to address that audience, packed audience, 1,200 people, about every other sentence, he'd turn around and he'd say, now, uh, Glenn Frank, he, he's got my name mixed, I've uh, got to tell you tomorrow about that wonderful missionary. Now you remember now and you tell them about that missionary. And after all, now you don't forget that. And so I did. Well, all these things are wonderful. You get hold of the lever and the gymnasium floated in. And then we use the same lever and the McAllister, the poorest college, Presbyterian college of all the 57 colleges is today the richest because we use the same lever. However, I have found the lever that I can take hold of best of all is that statement of Jesus where two or three agree. We use that almost like a religion. I don't care to have you touch the hymns, the garments and things, but if you want to make, have a power in your home, get harmony. If you want to have home, a power in your church, get harmony. If you want to have power in your business, get harmony. Why do I know? Jesus said where two or three agree, Whatsoever they ask in Jesus' name will be done. And the word agree comes from the same Greek word our orchestra comes from, orchestration, symphony. My father came to Des Moines as a young man and a lawyer, and a company he'd been invested some money in was failing, and finally they asked him to come in and see if he could save it. He didn't know insurance, but he knew men, so he invited the agents in from all over the state of Iowa, and he said, now we want to be one big happy family. He created harmony. They went out and they doubled their business within a year. He was made manager of agents of another company, they doubled their business within a year. He was made president of another company, they doubled their business within a year. Ralph Budd, young man, uh, taught me mathematics in high school, he used to go out and study my father's methods. When he became president of the Great Northern, when he found I lived in St. Paul, he'd have me come down and look over his methods. He said, I'm using your father's methods. I built that spirit, marvelous harmony here, and they're more, uh, and uh, there are more people, men are getting better salaries than other companies who do anything to get into a place where there's this harmony. And it succeeded. They made him president of Burlington. And he's now retired, and his little boy is now president of Great Northern. And the Time magazine said, 
practically half the railroad presidents of America got their training under Ralph Budd. If you want success in business, uh, get together and symphonize together. I was talking before a group of men uh, the, uh, the uh, University of California and Leland Stanford out in, at uh, Selamar. We were having a camp farthest out. That's such a big campgrounds that it's, uh, they have to have two camps at the same time. And they invited me one afternoon to come over and talk to them. A bunch of cynical young men in discussion groups. And I said that 25 years ago, there's a man named Red Grange at the Illinois University. And he's been voted the greatest halfback of the last 50 years. His team defeated all the Big Ten teams by immense scores. Uh, they hadn't played Minnesota yet, and Minnesota lost by immense scores to the same teams. So when Illinois came up to play Minnesota, I went over to see the game, expecting to see Illinois lo win 50, I mean 80 to nothing. And to my surprise, Minnesota won 27 to 7. The next week, one of the men came over, and he said, uh, you'll be interested, Mr. Clark, to know that we used your philosophy last week. The Thursday night before the game, the team got together and we said, we know what's the matter with us. We're divided into three rival fraternities. Let's bury the hatchet. And then one of the boys named Shutty said, fellas, there's one thing we haven't tried yet. And they said, what? Prayer. Now, the one of them knew how to pray, so they said, Shutty, you will have to do it. And so he stumbled through a little awkward prayer that they would do their best. Then I said to these men, not a one of you, I can see not a one of them had been believing anything I was saying. I said, not a one of you ever heard of Shutty. You all heard of Red Grange. Red Grange made seven points that day, and Shutty made 27 points. Then a young man leaped to his feet and he, on the back row, and he said, I wasn't believing a word you said until now. Mr. Shutty's son is my best pal. Mr. Shutty is the coach of a football team, a college team on the Pacific Coast, and his team wins first place nearly every year in his league. And he has a better influence on the boys than the president of the college has. Fellas, you better listen to that guy. He knows what he's talking about. I want to say the Cat's Father Stout's a living example of that. We have harmony always in that council ring. I used to go to, the, to meetings of, of conventions, and I'd sit down with the leaders and the uh, committees in charge. And I'd find oh, a bitterness between the evangelist and the psychologist. Psychologists thought the evangelist was an old fogey. The evangelist thought the psychologist was the son of the devil. And there's that bitterness and there's no power. You, you just could go that high. And I said, if I just made some discoveries, I, someday I'm going to start a camp where we can at least prove this thing. Why the, 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 the little splits of you? If you were in a church where they have division, the first thing you do when you go back, start to pray and build that, break that down. Uh, Dr. Brower, the pastor of the largest Baptist church on the Pacific Coast, said, uh, my little son said, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Jones, president of the ladies' aid, reminds me of a porcupine. Uh, why? She got a lot of fine points, but she can't get close to her. <laughs> and then he said, I'd rather have a drunkard in my church than a troublemaker, and any minister here will agree with me. Every minister here will agree with me. These troublemakers are the bane of the church. It is the vice of the virtuous, said Drummond, and the greatest thing in the world, that, we, uh, that so many Christians think they have a right to have some righteous indignation. And they are pouring out righteous indignation, judging this and judging that and criticizing this. Well, there's the power. We can stop there. Come out. Uh, find the lever you have. Uh, and I began to find leverages in the in illnesses. And a woman came to me had a goiter and a tumor. And uh, I said, uh, uh, was there anything in the past that you wanted very much that you couldn't have? And she said, yes. I was envious of other people that had it. Are you willing to relinquish it now? And he, she said, yes. And I said, all right, let's throw it out the window. I said, oh, here's a woman that had a little Ford car and her neighbor got a Cadillac. And she wanted a Cadillac, but she couldn't afford it and she really didn't need it. But if you want a thing hard enough, you'll get it. And she wanted to keep up with the Joneses, so she got a Cadillac, put it in her garage, it was too big and it stuck out, and where it sticks out, we'll call that a growth. Now, you wanted some things that didn't fit in you, and they stick out in the form of growth. If you can get, relinquish this wish of yours and get contented and at peace, all will be well. I've written a booklet called The Lord's Prayer, and in it you'll find a divine plan. You take this booklet and shake it every morning and read that 
that divine plan just like you're taking medicine. Do that for the next three weeks. And I'll pray for you. Then the three weeks she wrote, I just came from the doctor. He said, my goiter and tumor are vanishing away and I won't need an operation. That led me to write a book called How to Find Help Through Prayer in which I tried to find the, uh, the causes behind each disease. Uh, some people rather scoffed at it, but in a few years later, all the magazines burst forth with a new discovery of the doctors called psychosomatics, and they laid the same causes. Uh, uh, if you have asthma, it's because you have too much self-pity. Or if it's a child, it's because they're tied too much to the mother's apron string. And if you have a, if you yearn for something that doesn't belong to you, it manifests as a growth. And if you have a lot of resentment in it, he, uh, hidden resentment, it may become malignant. However, people who have cancer are not sinners. You'll find in their past someone has been very unjust to them. Very, very unjust. Very unjust. And they have been very polite and didn't tell anybody. They just uh, concealed it. Some of you know Ray Chittick, my beloved uh, son, brother-in-law, the most spiritual man in many ways I think that ever walked the streets of Chicago. Uh, he uh, was chemist for a great baking powder company. The two old men who owned it just brought him in and they practically made him vice president. That is, they leaned on him as if he was vice president. Uh, that during the World War, they, uh, they couldn't use certain things and he invented a new device, a new combination that is better than the old things, and they saved the company $600,000 every year. But when the two old men died, the son came in and came around and said, we're going to get rid of you older men. I want to put in a lot of new men. Or Ray said, I'd like to stay in two years longer. I'm working on an invention that's going to save your company a lot. Well, we can get along all right. And he gave him a pension of $50 a month. And after a couple of years, he sent a letter. That, well, our business hasn't been doing very well. After getting all these uh, young bloods in that didn't know how to run the business, it was going down somewhat. So we'll have to cease sending you the gratuity. Calling it a gratuity, a man who'd saved the company millions of dollars. Uh, if the old men had lived, they'd probably like to make him president. But I said to my sister, and he died of cancer, I said, uh, was there any injustice done to him? She said, I'm sorry to say there was, and she told me about it, but she said, Ray said, don't let's tell anybody, let's just try to forget it. Let's just try to forgive him. And he tried to forget it. But down inside, he, it was there, gnawing away. Jet, uh, Senator Taft died unexpectedly from cancer, and why? And uh, they didn't know where the, the cause of it. Wasn't that made it? They discovered where the, they could find where it began. They could have gone at it. Down in Texas, they brought a, they said, they accused his group of trying to steal the votes. The one thing that honest, the most honest man in all the Senate. Everybody, even the opponents, had great respect for Senator Taft. But politicians would be politicians, and they were all blaming them, trying to get the votes away from the, the Taft delegation and all that, and they claimed things. But now Taft is just so sensitive that he, but he was polite. He wasn't going to wreck the party by, uh, he just quietly concealed it inside. And it manifested just like that. You can always tell. The doctors told me I can tell what a man's thinking when he comes to uh, diagnose what his trouble is. If I could only gotten to Taft and said, uh, uh, our anger is the punishment we inflict upon ourselves because of the wrongdoing of another. Now, if he had been a McCarthy and had swore it all out in profanity and all the papers and everything else, he wouldn't have died of cancer, he'd have died of apoplexy. <laughs> well, I want to say the most powerful leverage in the, hu in the world was described beautifully by Zeta Sherry this afternoon. We can sometimes smile. I want to say I deal with, uh, with the intellectuals who can't quite understand uh, about what's called the blood of Jesus. And I don't talk about the blood of Jesus uh, in the colleges. They don't understand, wouldn't understand quite what it meant. But Star Daly said, I never knew of a thoroughly conditioned criminal who was ever changed by psychology or penology or anything but, uh, but the uh, redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Marvelous power. 
You can't explain it by philosophy. Just can't explain it. I just cannot explain it. It doesn't seem logical. Why a theosopher said to Sardini, you will have to go through 77 reincarnations before you can work off the karma that you've caused by this 25 years in the underworld. It'll be like a mole digging its way through a mountain. And Star just left him aside. He said, I won't have to go through all those reincarnations. He said, reincarnation, he said, is for those who live by law. Heaven is for those who live by grace. He said, all my sins were washed away by the love of Jesus Christ. You can't explain it. Over there in India, they couldn't understand it. And over in India, you find people suffering. They say, well, how did you do something? Oh, if you don't help that person dying and suffering and all that. If you save him now and heal him, then in the next incarnation, he'll have to go through all that suffering. Let him get all his punishment uh, through all this suffering now, and that'll, uh, then he can have a happier life in his next incarnation. So they don't have any mercy for anybody. Why, I, I want to just tell you, the more you travel around, the more you find Jesus Christ who hung on a cross, crossed out the little eye with a dot over it on the outstretched arms of love. Whenever we uh, cross out the little eye with a dot over it on the outstretched arms of love, we become a, a channel by which marvelous things come. Little, uh, little Lillian uh, Dixon is just uh, racing yourself out of the picture, just bringing marvelous things into Formosa. And uh, Jesus, there he hung on the cross. And then they all laughed at him. They said, he saved others, why didn't he save himself? And here all his disciples had run away. The only one that remained was, uh, was a relative. The strongest of his disciples had uh, betrayed, uh, denied him, and the weakest had betrayed him. And there he hangs on the cross. Now, is, what does he say? Does he say, uh, uh, Matthew, you write a story of my life, and, and Peter, you build a big church, and Stephen, you collect a lot of money? No, those things happen afterwards. His thought wasn't on what he had to get, but what he had to give. And what does he have to give? Why, uh, silver and gold has he none. Why, the foxes have holes, and the birds have nests, and he had no place to lay his head. They've even taken his garments away. They're casting lots for his, uh, for his robe. And there he hangs with nothing to, uh, to give, and yet, in his final words, he turns and he gives to the thief paradise. He gives to his mother a son. And he gives to his accusers forgiveness. You can't stop a man like that. If I ever needed any other proof of the, of the divinity of Jesus, that would be enough. One who could give, even up and he had nothing seeming to give, and giving himself as he did on the cross there for us to, to live, uh, be saved, on the outflow of that giving, there's been a flood of uh, devotion and, uh, and, uh, and worship and blessing flowing back to him. A, a, a gunman of, of New York came across to Star Island the last time I was there. He didn't attend any meetings, he just came to see me. I said, what do you want to see me for? He said, I'm one of the gunmen, and one of the underworld of, um, of, uh, of New York City. And I came over here to see the father-in-law of Norman Elliot. I said, what do you mean? He said, a CFO lawyer got me out of the penitentiary. I've been in it many, many times, but he did it only on one condition, that I'd go to a Camp Father's Stout. He gave me a scholarship. And I went, and the older men there were too uh, up beyond me, and that I, he said, I'm a son of a rabbi. I disgraced the family. I don't ever intend to go back to them. They wouldn't take me back. I'm a prodigal son of the worst kind. They weren't able to reach me, but I said, that Norman Elliot, he kind of talks down on my level. I'm going around and have a talk with him. And Norman said, suppose the three of us take a walk.